Hello, hi and welcome to Pop Talks Revision Slam. I'm Stuart Bird and here are the fabulous co-presenters. Hi, I'm Lily, thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Annabelle, great to have you here. Uh, good to have you with us guys. So you regular Pop Talks viewers may have noticed that this isn't just the usual culturally enriching and entertaining and intriguing episode that you are so used to. Tonight is very much practically focused around the couple of months ahead of us. Yes, this is Revision Slam. Everything you need to know about your upcoming exams, revision and how to get through it all successfully. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I never know how to start my revision. So whether you're staring at two long months of GCSEs or A-levels ahead, or like us in year 12 facing end of year exams, we've got you covered. Exactly. Our amazing array of guest speakers have been specially selected to give us the skills that we need. We've got four incredible speakers in our lineup tonight. First will be Peps McRae, educator, author and legend, here to educate you on the science of memory. We also have Lauren Stegman, MBE and Paralympian, will be talking to you about the necessity and the value of determination. She'll be followed by Lola Anderson, uh, who will be talking about mindset and preparation, how to visualise success in order to execute it. Lastly tonight will be the exam study expert, William Wadsworth, who will be here for strategic, practical takeaways, things that are going to make a difference in your revision and in your exams. It's going to be great. I'm very excited. <laughs> uh, we all are. Uh, memory, determination, mindset, strategies. OK, enough from us. Let's do this and hear from our speakers. Now, our first speaker, Peps McRae, is an award-winning teacher educator, designer and author. Peps has three master's degrees, is Dean of Learning Insight at Ambition Institute and has, um, is author of the Ultra Concise High Impact Teaching Series. Tonight, Peps will be giving you a small insights into the many ideas surrounding memory and informing you how to utilise this information to not only boost your learning, but to help you revise. Pets, great to have you. Thanks, folks. Very exciting to be here. Um, uh, like revision is an incredibly important part of school, and so delighted to be able to talk to you a little bit about some of the kind of science that might underpin how we can do a good job of it. And the particular science that we're going to zoom into is the science of memory. OK, and so what we're going to do over the next 18 minutes or so is we're going to talk about some of the kind of big ideas that are useful for us to know about what memory is and how it works. And then we're also going to talk about some kind of practical strategies that we can use to make the most of our memory. And these things will hopefully lay the scene for some of the later talks that you're going to hear this evening. So without further ado, let's dive in. Here are the kind of five big ideas that we're going to talk about first. I'll let you have a quick read and then we're going to dive into each of them in turn. OK, so the first big idea is that memory is a powerful lens for teaching. And that just means it's a powerful way of thinking about learning and teaching as well. And one of the problems is that memory often gets wrapped up in this idea of rote memorization. And sometimes we can take a bit of a negative view of the concept of memory. But actually, in reality, memory is a really integral part of learning. And so the more we understand about how memory works, the more we understand about how learning works. And then the kind of final thing to say on this is that memory is a really important part of learning, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. Our motivation, the kind of social situation, that we find ourselves in and the kind of culture of our school and our local community also have a big impact on our learning as well. But we're just going to zoom in to memory uh, tonight because I. Big idea is that our memory has two main parts or it's best. The best way to think of it is, is of having two main parts, our long term memory and our working memory. So our long term memory is essentially our mental map of the world. OK, as we go through life, as we kind of learn our subjects at school, what we kind of do, what our brain does is it builds this mental map of the world that tries to be as accurate as possible. Now, that mental map is everything we know, 
our knowledge, our skills, our kind of dispositions, our beliefs, even our identity, who we are. It is everything that we know and everything that we are as well. Now, the other main important part of our memory is our working memory. And our working memory is the kind of container for our thinking and attention. It's the piece of our brain or memory that points us to focus on something, thinks about it, and when it does that, it actually changes our long term memory. If our long term memory is a bit like this map, then our working memory is a bit like the pencil that you know draws or even edits or changes that map. And so these two parts of memory work together really closely to help us learn and to help us remember things over time. And the more we know, the more we can end up thinking about and the more we can think about, the more we can end up learning. So we're going to dive into exactly how that works next. So let's zoom into working memory in particular. So one of the important features of working memory is that we can only think about a very few number of things at once. It's a bit like juggling. If you've ever tried to juggle, you'll know that if you try to take on two or even three things, it's very quick that you drop all of them. And our brain kind of works in a similar way or working memory works in a similar way. If we try to think about too many things at once, we end up dropping all the balls. Multitasking, which you might have heard of, is actually a myth. It's not possible to do it. When we multitask, what scientists have found out is that we really are task switching, switching very quickly between different tasks. And when we do that, actually, it ends up being a slower way to learn things or to even get things done. And so it's better just to focus on one thing at a time and then switch when we're done. So as you know, if you think you're good at multitasking or someone in your family does, you can tell them, hey, it's not quite what the science suggests. It's better to focus on one thing at a time. Now, what does this feel like to um, you know, drop all of the balls? Well, imagine I asked you to memorize this uh, like string of letters. Um, most people could do it. They'd be able to like look at these string of letters for a few seconds, close their eyes and then write them down. No problem at all. However, if I asked people to memorize a longer string of letters, for example, this is nine letters, then most people would start to struggle at this point because our brain's not able to hold this number of things in our mind at once. And if I asked somebody to try and memorize this 12 character, this 12 letter string, then it would be really, really hard. Most people wouldn't be able to do it because our brain is just trying to juggle too many things uh, and we basically drop all the balls and we can't remember any of them. Now, this is all fine, um, but the stuff we're talking about here is actually, um, or really is really simple things to try and remember and think about. And the stuff that you're trying to learn in school is way more complicated. So even though there's like a famous finding that suggests that we can, in our heads, hold a roughly seven things, between five and nine things, seven plus or minus two things, when it comes to anything more complex, like the stuff you're trying to remember for revision in, in school, you can think about much, much less than that. Now, how do we get around this? Well, one of the things that we can do is to use our long term memory to help make up for some of the shortcomings or shortfalls of our working memory. And essentially what our brain does is it chunks together lots of different ideas. And when it makes really strong connections between those ideas, our brain's able to treat those multiple ideas as just one thing, as one ball to juggle. Now, what does this mean? Well, let me try and make the example a bit more concrete. So I've just introduced you to you know, these different letters or letter strings, as it were. And we said the one at the bottom has 12 letters in it, which is too many for most people to be able to remember. But if I reordered those letters and they now I took on this form, a lot of people would be able to remember them. OK, these are kind of famous TV channels for those of you who don't recognize them. But what's happened is even though there's still 12 letters there, our brain recognizes that there are connections between some of those letters. BBC, our brain no longer treats as three different letters, but it treats as one uh, complete chunk. And so our brain is only trying to remember four different chunks here, which is easier than the, than the, the string of letters at the top. And so that's how our long term memory, when we make connections and we like, you know, make it stronger, helps to make up for the shortcomings of our working memory, which can only focus on a very few number of things at once. 
And this effect adds up and adds up and allows us to do extraordinary things like reading. If you think about actually what happens when you read, you're interpreting a load of all these different squiggles on a page. It's, it's insane how quickly you can process all of this information. But the reason you can do it is because you've built up that mental map, your long term memory over a long, long period of time, which enables you, which allows you to be able to think very, very quickly about some, some stuff about letters on a page, basically. The final big idea that it's important for us to know is that memory is much more like a forest than a filing cabinet or a library. When we uh, you know, create a new memory, it's not like we kind of just put it like a book onto a shelf or like we file it away like a file in our computer folder, ready to be able to take out of the shelf later down the line or you know, open up on our computer. It's not really the way memories work. Instead, memories are really quite hard to plant. If we do manage to plant the seed of a memory, then we have to nourish it quite a lot to get it to grow. And even if it does manage to grow, big, then it's often subject to interference from other plants or other memories. So basically, when we create a new memory, uh, it has an effect on our old memories. So in fact, memories are much more like a living thing rather than a kind of like a library or a computer folder. OK, so those are the five big ideas about memory that are really important for us to know. The more we understand how memory works, the better we can harness our own learning. Pause for a second that you read these and then we're going to look at some of the practical strategies that kind of come out of these ideas. OK, so practical strategies, a quick run through. Um, will will pick up on a lot of these in more detail in his talk later on. So here are the five big strategies that we can use to try and make the most of our memory and help us learn and revise in effective ways. The first big idea is eliminating distractions. So if our brain can only really pay attention to you and think about one thing at a time, then the best thing we can do is eliminate all of the different things that we could possibly be distracted about by so that we increase the chances that we focus on that one thing for as long as we possibly can. And so that might involve you, you know, getting yourself in a space where there are minimal distractions. It might mean putting your phone in a different room. It might mean making sure that you're not interrupted, whatever it is to try and keep you focused because interruptions can be really costly for learning. In fact, it's not just the duration of the interruption, but you, you tend to lose a lot more learning time beyond just the in, interruption itself. So, for example, say my son comes to the door now and you know, interrupts me. What will happen is I kind of drop all of the balls that I was juggling. I might start thinking about something else and then it could take me, you know, 30 seconds or even a minute to get back to the point where I was in my thinking and revision. And so even though an interruption might be short, the kind of time that it takes away from our potential learning can be quite great. And so interruptions can add up to quite a lot of lost learning time over time. And so we want to try and reduce them as much as possible. The different ways that we can um, reduce interruptions are thinking about like our environment. So are there things in our environment like our phone or distracting pictures or you know people outside the window that might distract us? Let's try and reduce those as much as possible. There can also be social interruptions. So people coming to the door or people calling us or you know people trying to distract us. Reducing other people like interrupting us is an important thing to do. And then we can also be guilty of interrupting ourselves in some ways as well. And so trying to reduce the chances that we kind of interrupt ourselves, you will all know the things that you do to interrupt yourself over time are important as well. And then the last thing to kind of say is that in order to reduce the distraction and when we're revising, we can try and make our revision as kind of like simple and straight as straightforward as possible. The more complex we try to make our revision, the process of revision, like the kind of more of the, wind, the windy path that we take, the, the more distracting it is. And so it's always better to try and get from A to B as quick and as simple and as directly as possible. Uh, there's a guy called Doug Lamov and he says, take the shortest path. And so if you remember that when you're revising, that will really help. OK, big insight, big strategy number two is streamlining communication. So what does that mean? Well, basically when we're revising or when we're being taught, there are a number of different modalities or modes that we can access information through. It could be listening to somebody talking. It could be uh, reading something using text. You might be looking at a diagram, gesture. Lots of these different modes can convey information. Now, each of these different modes have different 
ways that they interact with our working memory. For example, when I am reading a piece of text, I can read it at my own pace. I can take my time, I can go back and I can reread things. Whereas if I'm you know, watching a video, it's much harder to do that. I have to kind of keep up with the pace of the person talking. Diagrams, conversely, allow me to make connections better than, um, than text or speech often do. And so these different kind of modalities, as we might call them, allow us to use our working memory in different ways. And so we just, it's worth like thinking carefully about what's the best modality for me trying to learn this particular thing. Now, modalities work together as well, and they have their pros and cons when they interact. For example, when I read the words off this slide, you end up processing the same information twice. And so often we have to be careful how we kind of like try to use these modalities together. Often it can be better for to basically have someone talk over an image like I'm doing now. And similarly, if you can you know, listen to a video where somebody is talking over images that are relevant, that can help you kind of get more for your money in terms of what your brain is able to process. The next big kind of idea that we want to zoom into is this idea of optimizing the load, which basically means getting, making sure that we're juggling the right amount of stuff. Because if we try to like think about too little, then we can easily get bored and distracted. If we try to like think about too many things at once, then like we said earlier, we will drop all the balls. And there's this kind of like sweet spot in the middle, this orange line that where we're just thinking about enough to occupy our working memory and to get us into the zone, as it were. Now, how can we do this? Well, you know, some of the things that we can do are to um, break things down into smaller and smaller chunks, because the smaller we make things, the more we're able to like learn them and digest them and build on them. So if you're faced with something to learn, first thing you want to do is break it down. How can I break it down into like little bite sized pieces that then I can build up over time? The next thing that you might want to think about is, you know, if you're trying to tackle a big problem, um, only tackle one piece of piece of it as a, at a time. We sometimes need to outsource some of our memory because we can't think about everything at once. And so if you're doing a math question that involves you trying to find out the area of a sector and you're really trying to understand the area of the sector bit, you don't want to spend loads of your working memory on doing the multiplication side of things. So we use a calculator in that instance. Of course, it's important that at another time you build up your fluency and your times tables, but you can only really focus on helping your brain get better at one thing at a time. So sometimes you've got to use these other tools to help you outsource some of your working memory to them so that you can focus on the important part of the learning. And then the final thing to call it is that routines are really powerful in helping us for, to help us make sure we're making the most of our cognitive load, our working memory. Because when you have a routine in place, basically it means that we have to think less about what to do next, what, what's going on here. And as a result, we can think more about the what, the stuff we're actually trying to learn. And so the more you can put in routines into place about your revision, the probably the more progress you'll make, the faster you will learn. The next fourth big idea is building connections. OK, like I said earlier, this mental map of the world is basically made of connections that we make. And sometimes we can get um, a, a kind of a false idea of how we should be learning, because if you think about how um, scientists or mathematicians or historians learn, what they do is they go out and they try to discover things. They use problem solving, they use a scientific method, and they do lots of discovery. And this is how those people develop new knowledge for the world. They use this process of discovery and they have to do it because there is no book that they can turn to to read and learn from. However, in school, people have discovered a lot of the knowledge that we're learning or all of the knowledge that we're learning. And so the process that we use can be different and probably should be different. And so rather than trying to discover stuff or using discovery and problem solving and scientific method to learn things in the school, actually it's much better just to use explicit methods of learning where somebody else helps us to join the dots, help, helps us to make the connections really clearly for ourselves. So in short, try not to discover things for yourself, just get somebody to teach you really clearly and you'll make more progress. This quote sums it up quite nicely. One of the things that can really help us make good connections or build lots of connections over time is the use of examples. And so the more examples we can use in our learning, ah, here's an example, here's another example, and another example will help us get clarity on, on a concept. 
However, we can take this idea even further, and as well as generating examples and looking at examples, we can think about non-examples, examples of not a thing. Here's an example. Here are some not examples of a triangle. And so now when we have got like a kind of a mental map of what triangles are and what triangles aren't, it really helps our brain sharpen up its understanding of what a triangle is. And then the very last and final kind of implication or idea for us to bear in mind is the idea that as well as building connections, we've got to consolidate them. We've got to strengthen them in our mind because we forget. OK, like I said earlier, our brain is not like a filing cabinet. We can't just put a memory in and take it back out whenever we want to. Actually, what happens is our brains forget stuff over time. And this is a very famous effect. And basically, the more that we can revisit ideas, the more that we end up remembering them. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about this because William's going to be diving into this in a lot more detail. So I'm going to stop there. That's everything from me tonight. Let's jump ahead. And yeah, here are the big ideas that we're going to that we've looked at today. And here are the key strategies that we've covered. 20 minutes is up. I'm going to pause there, hand over to Stuart and good luck with the rest of the evening. Thanks, Peps. Thank you so much, Pat. That was really insightful. Now, just a reminder, once our break speakers are done, there will be a Q&A session at the very end. So please do send us your questions using the chat function on Teams. Or if you're watching live on YouTube, make sure you're signed in so you can ask any questions. Now, um, I'm going to introduce our second speaker, Lauren Steadman, MBE, who is a British Paralympic athlete who has represented Team GB in both swimming and paratriathlon competing in four Summer Paralympics. Not only that, Lauren has also competed in SAS Who Does Wins and Strictly Come Dancing, a personal favourite show of mine. Lauren is an inspiration for many as she has never let her disability hold her back from achieving her ambitions. She has achieved so much and arguably down to the unbeatable power of determination. And tonight we'll be talking to you about this superpower. Lauren, over to you. Hello, can can I be seen and heard, heard first? Yes, we're all good. OK, well, thank you for having me. Um, super insightful stuff that we've just listened to. Um, lots of things that I think I still do. Um, for those that don't know, I've just started a PhD, so I feel like it's all very relevant to me as well with the revision and the reading and the topics. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm now going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully this works. Um, we are going to go through, so you need to go back to the window you were sharing. So here we go. Um, perfect. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about my own journey, but also um, some of the things that I may have learned that I can transfer as well uh, to you guys with all of your revision prep, um, just because I think there's a lot of things that cross over between uh, the the world of sport and athletics um, and also that of what we need for academics um, and at the end of the day just achieving high performance in whatever we set our mind to whether that is sports or you know academic or even parents that are listening um, in everyday life um, the things that we can use um, are interchangeable so um, it says here uh, Laura Seven Paralympic World European and British champion uh, it has taken me it says here 16 years to get the, the race right. So I started my um, my athletics career when I was 11 years old. I was a very young girl. Uh, I was 15 years old when I represented Great Britain at my first Paralympics in Beijing. Um, so I've done Beijing and London for swimming. I've done and then I, I transferred post London um, from swimming to triathlon and did um Triathlon at Rio and then the recent games, Tokyo, and we'll look to hopefully, if I can secure enough points um, and qualification this year, go to Paris next year and defend um, getting the gold medal. Um, so it's super exciting for me. But I guess my, my first point in, in straight in there is that I got the gold medal in 2021. It took me 17 years of being exceptionally disciplined and it did not always go the way I planned, the way I wanted. But if you want something bad enough, no matter how long it takes, as long as your intention, your effort, your attitude is there, you will achieve it. Um, so, so for me, you know, the 17 years and 
I often look at it thinking, I have 17 years of all those 445 starts, all of the, the sacrifices, they're not they're not doing things that we we often have to make choices as athletes. Um, and normally they may they might sound like the small things, um, you know, the early nights, the not going out with friends, um, missing numerous now that I'm getting well, I am 30 now that I'm at this age, the weddings that go on, like there are a lot of sacrifices um, that you do make as an athlete. But when I stood there on that podium, full Great Britain kit and that gold medal, I just, like ev ev every single bit of, of sacrifice, of hard work, of pain, of pushing when it was just, you thought you couldn't push anymore, it was worth it. And singing my heart out with the national anthem, um, it, it was exceptional. But and th th this, this slide here says harnessing resilience. In my triathlon career, I can sit here and say currently three times world champion, seven times European, uh, you know, numerous accolades, silver in Rio, gold in Tokyo. That sounds incredible. And I'm very, very proud. I haven't always had the easiest races in triathlon. For a start, triathlon is exceptionally painful. But I had a career before that in swimming. And the slide here says failure equals learning. We often, especially when it comes to grand events, for me, that could be racing. I've, I've done, obviously, GCSEs, A-levels. Um, I did my undergraduate, my postgraduate, and now onto my PhD. The nerves and the anxiety can get to us before, uh, before we do anything that is important to us. And one skill that I have actually managed to harness really well, when you get that nervousness inside you, it is a good thing. It is to be embraced because actually your body is going into fight or flight mode. And that means that it's important to you. If you didn't feel like that, I would be slightly concerned because actually you're just doing something and you know it doesn't mean that that much to you. But for most of us, when we're going into something that's going to test us, that's going to you know help us grow, we do feel a little nervous because we don't know what the outcome is. We cannot control it. What we can control is our effort and is our attitude that goes into it. So by 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 feeling that, embracing it, but knowing that we have ticked off everything that we need to do in order to be prepared for that one moment, that is what I now use in particular when I was in Tokyo. Um, everyone probably would think thinking, Lauren, you must have been you must have been exceptionally nervous. This was the biggest Paralympics has been yet you're going in trying to get that gold medal yes I, I felt that but what I actually felt a bit more was really cool and calm I was watching Grey's Anatomy the night before drinking a cup of Tetley's tea because Paralympics GB had put the cups of tea in there and I wondered why I felt so calm like I should be going through my race plan but I realized that those six months the years before this actual one race I had done everything I could think of. I'd moved countries. I'd done every session. I'd got all the sleep. I'd eaten perfectly. My body weight was on point. My hydration was key. If I have done everything in my power that I possibly can before, before this moment, so for me, before the race, for you, before the exam, whatever it is, whatever the outcome is, you gave it your best. And nobody, not even yourself, can ask for any more than that. And that is just your best effort. Um, and so I think for me, I was prepared. I knew what I had to do. I'm, you know, old school athlete now. I've been around the block a few times. I just had to go out there and believe in myself. Know that it's in there. Know that I just need to learn to bring it out. Um, which brings me on here to this, feel the fear and do it anyway. Pushing your boundaries. I think I was born having one arm. And potentially people, my mother would say that I'm stubborn. I quite happily go for, I am determined. And I have always lived my life with this sense of, if you feel safe and comfortable, that's lovely. You know, you've created a great environment. How do we grow? How do we become that one step bigger, that one step better? Uh, and for me, it was feeling that fear, knowing that oof, I might not do so well here, but I could do really great and actually, if it is a failure, it's actually the best possible outcome you could get because we don't learn when we're successful or we do things well. We learn when we do things wrong and we learn what doesn't work for us and, and what we can reshape and we won't do again. So for those that don't know my story, I got to the Paralympics in Rio, gold medal favourite, and I misjudged the swim course and I swam the wrong way. It actually cost me that gold medal. Came home with a silver, was distraught had said to, to my dad beforehand, the only thing I don't want to hear is the American anthem. And I was stood there with this silver medal listening to this American anthem. 
it was the most painful thing that's ever happened in my career because as an athlete, you know, we we prepare for everything, but I hadn't done the swim recce because of water pollution. It took me about seven months to get over, actually. I really withdrew from sport and stepped away. But what I did learn, well, one is I've always done a swim recce and always swum the right way after that, was that I was a very strong athlete. I didn't panic in that one moment. I didn't, a lot of people would have been like, oh, it's game over. I thought, okay, it's done, right. I got back to silver medal position by the end of the swim. I probably cooked myself inside. It was Copacabana, it was really hot. Um, but yeah, I, I got back to where it was. I could have panicked. I could have thrown the toys out of the pram, but I didn't. I kept a cool head. I controlled what I could control. Couldn't control anything else, just what I could. And I still came away with a, a silver medal. Super, super proud of that. Could it have been better? Yes, but I learned so much about my personality and where my strengths lie. And it is not to panic in a moment where actually lots of people would. And this comes back to this pushing the boundaries. We mentioned that there was SAS. We mentioned that there was Strictly. I've recently decided to try and go to a winter Paralympics for cross country skiing. You're probably thinking, can you ski? We did it when I was little. Um, and then it's been 10 years since I've ever done it again. But it's a new challenge. I'm a beginner again. And as, as you get older in life, you seem to settle into things you can do. Never stop learning, never stop wondering what is the best version that I can be? What can I do to help myself grow? Like I have this big thing when I'm 70 years old, maybe even 80 because 30 now, it's only 40 years away. I'll be sipping my, my red wine with my olives in a veranda somewhere in Italy. And I wanna say to the person next to me, I did everything I could. I was the best version of myself. Um, is it easy? No, but if it was easy, then everybody would do it. You gotta have the faith. You've gotta have the determination and, the ability to push through when others don't push through. Developing determination. This is a cute little picture of me. Clearly my mother took it. Um, journey into elite sport. Did I always know what I wanted to be? No, I definitely didn't. Um, I think when I was younger, I wanted to be a vet because I love animals or I wanted to be an air hostess because I always thought those, those young ladies were exceptionally pretty. Um, so my mum threw me into sports. Sports for me was a chance to prove to all the other kids, yes, I'm missing an arm, but I'm just as great as you are. Um, it helped me find friends. I was part of the teams. I was active. I was, you know, everything I, I, I am now is, is definitely from doing sport as a youngster. I didn't know that Paralympics existed when I was little. Um, compared to now, we know about, you know, we know about it all. Um, so I felt sorry for the school teacher because she asked for someone to submit a competition and nobody put their hand up. So I said, I'll do it for you. Um, and, and then that was great. Um, I fell into it. Somebody was there. So I'm always saying to, to children, like when you're just representing your school, you just don't know who's watching. Like You could be scouted. You could be for anything. So again, comes back to that. Even when you're feeling lazy, when you're feeling tired and you don't particularly want to do something, do it. I can do it to the best of your, your abilities because it really did happen for me. Um, I think within the space of sort of six months to a year, I was on British Swimming Development Programme and all of a sudden this, this this world opened up of elite sport and I was on my way to, to Beijing um, to represent Great Britain. So it was quite a fast journey. Um, we don't always know what's best for us and opportunities always presented to us in different shapes and sizes. Um, so whilst you think your future, you know, this is what you're going to do, be open to exploring other avenues, um, especially in this day and age, there's so many things you can be and can explore. Uh, reshaping uh, preconceptions. I love it when somebody looks at me and they're like, oh, she's got one hand, how is she going to do this? Um, it's probably the worst thing that you can do because it, it starts this fire inside me that makes me be like, I'm going to prove to you that I, I can be anything, do anything. I think I'm probably only limited on monkey bars, um, but I'm sure if I really wanted to get around that, um, I could get around it. Um, but no, so it's been um, it's been interesting my whole life. I went on Strictly to one to see if I could learn to dance and dance very well. Um, but I think also to give confidence and install a sense of belief in other people. Um, so each and every week, I definitely knew that I was not the best dancer. But what I wanted was for um, anybody. I always say to my dad, like my dad had a sore hip. So I'm like, Dad, you're just, if not more disabled than me, like I do more sport than you. So everybody has something that limits them in one way or another. You all have a disability, whatever form that may be. And I wanted to give people the ability to think, actually, do you know what? I can do this. I might not do it the normal way, uh, but I, I, I will get it done. 
Um, and I think there's something powerful to be said for one, listening to uh, figures of authority, teachers, parents. Gosh, my parents have guided me my whole life, but also learning how you operate, what works for you. Just because everybody else does it one way doesn't mean you have to do it that way. I've always been the girl that's done things slightly different. People have looked at me. But if you think of you go on Google Maps and you try to get to a destination, it gives you three different ways to get there. Um, and it's having the confidence and belief that you know yourself best. And it takes years to learn yourself. I'm still learning that myself. Um, and, and you grow and you mature. But the one thing I'll say is, is, is have belief in yourself. Uh, remove any preconceptions that other people have of you, of, of what you're trying to do um, and embrace everything that you want to be. Uh, learning limits. So. Ability, not disability. Uh, that was kind of what I, I wanted to show by doing such a diverse range of SAS and then going on Strictly Come Dancing. Did I do it to prove to other people? As an element of that, but for me, actually, it was um, when I was 16 years old, I went to a careers fair and asked to join one of our military. So Navy, um, Royal Air Force, Marines, Army, and got told no because I have one hand. So of course, I just told you, if you say no to me, what happens? Um, so I got fired up and I got the chance to do the SAS Who Dares Wins and absolutely loved it. Um, and just to prove a point to myself that I can and I could have, um, I've taken a different path now and I'm about to change path again. Um, but yes, that in itself, um, yeah, it's just obviously ability, not disability. Um, handling pressure, finding the positives and uncaged ambition. I think the one thing that's got me through a lot of things in life um, as you get older, like more and more things happen and you get more and more stresses. But the one thing that there is, is to always find the positive in absolutely anything. I live life uh, with the cup half full, definitely not half empty. Did having a disability give me that perhaps? Um, but I just think in life that there are things that we can get hooked up about and, and for example, there's that end process of wanting to get good grades at school or wanting to get the gold medal. I've been there, I have done it, and it's consuming, it's overwhelming, it's tireless, it's it's everything. But what we I like to compartmentalize things. That is the end goal, and that would be a great goal to reach. But sometimes it doesn't happen. But there's a process that happens before that. And each and every day we should wake up enjoying what we do, being excited and yes, the reward at the end, if it's what we want, that is perfect. But if I spent the last 17 years and I never got that gold medal, I hope that each and every day I look back and it's been a joyful journey. The people that I've met, the skills that I've learned, the, the places around the world that I've seen. So learning to change your perspective on, on the journey of getting there. Um, you know, revision and, and everything that you guys are going through, you know, but the, the other one there is handling pressure is, it is tough I, and I, I can't lie. I mean, some of the, the methods that we're talking about earlier, I mean, I think somebody else will talk to you about visual, visualization in a bit, but I have a photographic memory and I do mind maps and still did that for Tokyo itself, Draw, drew the course out on a piece of paper so I knew where the, the turns were, where everything was on the bike, where I was gonna drop a gear, you know, so I, can visualize that in my head. But for all my revision, I was um, a, mi a mind map. So topic in the center and then my key points and everything there. I was in the exam, whether it's because I learned it in, in swimming, but I could literally pull back exactly where everything was. Um, so for me, that's like, that's just something I've learned. Um, and on, on this one here, un uncaged ambition. When you go for a job interview, Oh, it happened to me at university, I had five girls that did psychology with me and uh, one girl called Laura turned to me and she said, Lauren, I said, yes. She said, if we ever go for a job interview, I'm going to walk away. I said, well, what, what do you mean, Laura? She said, well, we've got the same first class honours in, in the degree, but look at what else you have outside of just doing your degree. So uncaged ambition. If you have a skill or something that makes you stand out, one day you're going to go for a job interview against thousands of people. Embrace your individuality. Be you. If there's something that you do, harness that alongside all your academics. As I said, be as whole as you can be, um, because one day you're going to need it. Be, be proud to be you. Be proud to be different. Uh, I think this is this is my last slide. I'm aware that, you know, I don't want to eat in too much of your time. 
heart of a lion, um, a combination of experience and optimism. It was my fourth games in Tokyo. I knew what I was doing. I knew how to handle myself. Um, and these things take time to learn. Heart of a lion. My coach he came up to me and he drew a very poor lion on my wrist. I said, why, why have I got this? He said, you will doubt at one point in this race. Doubt will creep in. You're only human. It's only natural to have one thing that might tip you off. He said, I want you to look at this and remember to be fierce. Race as or a lion would be if it was backed in a corner. It would fight. It would give it until it could not give any more. And there was a couple of points where I did doubt myself. And that surge of do not, you've got this, you've worked hard, came in. So even if you're in an exam, you need that boost of confidence. Lion or whatever it is, it and it resurged that, no, Lauren, push it aside. It's, it's a control thing, but um, it really worked. And then this, these points here is uh, Team Lauren and a support network. I am Lauren. It's like a Formula One car. Boom. I'm the racer. But actually, when I come into pit stop, there's people that, you know, the engine, the tyres, all those things. I have a team around me. You have a team around you. Never be afraid to ask for help. Never, never be afraid to question things and, and know why you're doing something, how to be better. You can always be better. Um, and also, it's OK to to take a break. I think that's one of the biggest things. My mum used to have to come in and be like, I think you need a cup of tea and a, and a break now, whether that was I was training too much, I was revising too much. Um, but yeah, just just I guess go out there and just be as as fierce as you can, but also know that you can ask for help, you can get guidance, um, and yeah, just yeah, be be the greatest you can be. I think I think that's me um, wrapped now, guys. Um, I'm gonna press stop presenting. I'm hoping that this works, and it just comes back to my face. I think I think that's working. Um, so I think I'm gonna hand back over to the girls now. Um, thank you to everybody for listening and I and I really hope that um, with everything you do in the revision period um, is super, super successful. Uh, I've got my fingers crossed for you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we just want to say we absolutely love the bit about feeling the fear um, and doing it anyway. Yeah, thank I think that's you. so important. Um, next up, we are lucky to hear from Lola Addison, a full time GB rowing athlete and an ex and High student. She recently won a gold medal in the quadruple skulls at the European Rowing Championships in 2022 and is already the third best in the world at age 25. Lola is an expert in goal setting and knows how to succeed. She'll be talking about how to prepare the mind for success and executing it. Over to you, Lola. Hi, um, thanks for that introduction, guys. I'm just going to try and share my presentation now. Hopefully it all goes OK. Is that sharing now? Not yet. Is that on? Oh my gosh. Can I just check, sorry? Yeah, not seeing it yet, Lola. Okay, sorry. Okay, I think I think this has worked now. That looks good. Yeah, now just play slideshow. Yeah, just clicking on that now. Sorry. OK, no worries. sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'm joining you all here today to talk a little bit about the attributes and skills I've collected as a professional athlete and how we can sort of apply those skills in their general form to academics and the sort of general study methods that you might look at. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I was lucky enough to be a student at Serpton High School in 2009 and initially I spent my time sort of wandering through the corridors, pre-rowing, uh, trying to rush to my classrooms, follow along with my friends and probably sort of find some of my homework because organising and planning was not sort of one of my original strengths that I had. Um, it wasn't until second year at Serpton that they introduced rowing as a sport and I immediately was extremely passionate. Uh, I wasn't very good to begin with and that took a lot of uh, time, dedication and sort of working my way through the sport to sort of work out and find my footing um, but I was very passionate and from the beginning I used to sort of uh, imagine myself in scenarios where I'd be racing at these big events that seemed sort of impossibly far off in my future and I would just spend a lot of time sort of daydreaming these scenarios away until eventually um, they became true. 
Um, so yeah, I learned to row at Surbiton. Uh, my dad uh, was a big rower before, and so I, I speak a little bit about him, but I learned to row at Surbiton. I first represented GB when I was 15 at a race called GB France. And then I built my way up from there to uh, sort of like GB Junior European Championships, GB World Euro uh, like World Championships, and then from there to under 23 World Championship level, and then from there on to senior and and I make myself into the senior team full time. Um, and these are a bunch of the girls women's squad that uh, we're all very happy because we've just finished some ball racing, so we're just happy to be done with it. Um, yeah, these are just some photos also from my rowing career over the last couple of years. Um, I've got pictures of me from um, when I was at Surbiton, not rowing very well, but still having uh, a lot of fun, smiling, celebrating with all of my friends. And uh, the same sort of story to the right, which is for just from the last year. And um, some photos of my dad actually rowing all the way back in 1980 in the black and white. Um, yeah, so I've picked up a lot of transferable skills along the way and that's what I will be talking about uh, tonight. So one of the big things we like to talk about within sport is our sort of attitude and our sort of our mindset. Um, we focus a lot obviously as athletes on training ourselves physically so from a strength perspective wanting to be strong enough to be the fastest out there on the water in my case or training ourselves to be physically disciplined and dedicated enough to be able to hold ourselves technically in order to get the most out of our speed. Um, but also obviously a huge part of sport is attitude and mindset. Um, we've spoken a lot tonight about essentially a lot of that comes down to how hard are you willing to push and challenge yourself? Um, but a big area of focus that we've had recently in our team has been sort of um, how can we sort of frame and control our mindset when we're in tough and tricky uh, situations and particularly like how can we help ourselves to be kind and positive and sort of frame things in a way that gets the most out of us as opposed to sort of living in a, a position of um, sort of uh, like negativity. Um, yeah so we like to think of the brain as another muscle to be trained and each thought that we have and make is a decision and an opportunity to make a difference in our mindset. Um, so areas of our like weakness and areas that we struggle with, um, I'm talking obviously in terms of sport and rowing, but for you girls that could be in the classroom or in a particular subject of yours, those aren't areas that we should sort of look to be sort of um, negative, harsh or critical on ourselves, but we should be enthusiastic about those places as uh, areas to improve areas for future success and um, areas to be excited about in that sense. So embracing the fact that we as people will always be flawed. We will always have things that uh, we don't naturally succeed at right away. And, and yeah, looking um, looking for these new challenges to be something that are like empowering to us. And um, once you get over that fear of failure um, and that sort of fear of rejection, sort of putting your hand up, being embarrassed in the classroom, sort of put yourself out there and, and be the one that asks or be the one that says, I, I don't understand. Uh, these are all things to sort of embrace as areas for potential personal growth. And um, at the end of the day, like they make us better as people. Um, we like we need to acknowledge, obviously, in sport, the irregularity of progress. So acknowledging that um, along the journey with sport and along the journey in school, um, some days you're not going to get everything right and again that's okay if we can bounce back from every sort of minor setback with a positive attitude a smile we don't have to love failure but we have to accept that it's something that comes our way uh, you'll be much more well-rounded as an individual because uh, life would be pretty boring to be honest if everything you did you just won at or succeeded straight away so um yeah we need to we need to be um, competent enough to understand that sometimes we don't always succeed that doesn't mean that we're failing. Um, the next thing that I would like to talk about really is consistency. So something that we've been talking about again a lot for years and years in sport and I'm sure it's not just rowing is just looking for the marginal gains in our daily routines. So um, when the difference between coming a world champion or a world silver medalist or even just missing out on a medal altogether can be sort of rounded down to a second or a point of a second. 
um, every single sort of marginal gain or every single little difference you make in your race plan can add up to be sort of um, very important. So when we're looking at every single day and that preparation over like a four year cycle into the end of the Olympics or for you girls into the end of your big exams, if I could look back and say, what would I have done differently? And if I could work out, if I could put an extra five minutes of work in every day, even if it seems something really silly, like for me, maybe doing five minutes extra stretching every day. Well, how would that improve my performance across the next four years? That would be massive. And for you girls, it might be, I might just reread my notes once every night before I go to bed, but that's essentially an extra like five minutes of revision every day then for the next couple of years. So these marginal gains, they add up a lot. And these are things that we don't really think of. We overlook them very easily. But once you've started to sort of um, integrate them into your lives more consistently, then you really start to notice the sort of the benefit of them. So um, we like to break that down again into two sections. So we might talk about consistency of mindset and then we'll also talk about of consistency of action. But um, mindset is often, sorry, consistency of action is often a, by, a byproduct of like mental control and sort of mind over matter. So um, I've spoken a little bit, a bit about this now saying sort of staking, staying focused and intent on work in and out of the classroom. So for me, the best way that I can understand that is saying, um, sometimes training is boring um sometimes it's long it's mundane i do it day in day out and although it's something that i love it doesn't mean that sort of the um wear and tear of it does just get a bit draining sometimes so i need to understand what it is in myself um that motivates me when i'm distracted or when i'm bored in my sessions and i need to work out what it is that i can either use to sort of uh, switch me back on in a session or I need to work out when this is that, that it particularly happens. Um, so I've also then spoken about bringing your A game every day, no matter what's going on in terms of a social or physical distraction. So again, a lot of you girls will have lots of clubs going on and you might be tired coming into training someday, or you might be distracted because there's other things going on in your lives. Um, but for me, my A game is something that I like to think about in terms of sort of three areas of performance. So I want to train myself physically as hard as I can each day. I want to train myself to my best technical standard. And I also want to make sure that I'm getting the most out of myself mentally uh, like with that positive mindset and also like pushing myself as hard as I can. So on some days I'm going to come in and it's just not going to be the day for me on one of those things. Let's say I'm physically really tired. Um, that could cause me to have a bit of a tantrum because I'm not getting the most out of my session. And then that could also sort of catastrophize the rest of my session and my rowing technique would go out the window or I could take a breath take a breather and realize look today one out of these three things is not going my way but I'm not going to let that deal derail the other two so in terms of consistency I haven't hit one of the targets today but overall my sort of progress is still moving in the right direction and that's the type of thing that we want to exercise our mindfulness and our attitude over in order to allow ourselves to be more consistent in our sort of discipline of action and how we train. Um, so yeah, willingness to sort of work through these challenges or setbacks um, is important because as I discussed earlier, nothing is ever gonna be straightforward in terms of hard work and discipline. It's not possible to do everything perfectly all the time. Um, and so we need to be able to understand that sometimes the smoothest and the most sort of straightforward uh, plans of action will always have lots of little tiny divots along the way where they just haven't really gone uh, sort of as perfect as it seems to the outside, the outsider looking in, but you are still sort of staying on track every single day. Um, and part of that might be asking your friends for help or your teachers for a little bit of help to hold you accountable. Um, or part of part of that might be sort of writing in a schedule or a to do list. Um, it all obviously depends on what sort of personal working style you have. Um, but I know I thrive off of staying in a group and working with a group because when I feel tired or when I feel sort of myself lagging behind, I can look to my teammates for support. I can look to my coaches for inspiration and I can look back to my sort of relationship conversations that I had with my um, my dad and my my uh, sort of parents and family support network and all of those people will help me stay on track and stay consistent 
Um, there's another sort of line here that we talk about quite a lot in training. We have lots of sort of one liner, uh, like cheesy motivational things to keep us going. Uh, but it's the line that says um, what has got us here will not um, take us to where we want to go. Uh, we like to talk about that a lot in terms of uh, keeping us motivated, keeping us on track and keeping us sort of fired and pushing, not just sort of equal the results that we got last year, but sort of push on for more. Um, so from a competitive point of view, that's just us always, you know, trying to trying to go for more. Better never stops. Just keep um, chasing perfection. Um, but from also just a bit more of a, a less competitive mindset point of view, it's, it's working out that um, Yes, there have been areas of, uh, of success and success doesn't just come on its own. So what have we done well to do to sort of achieve these results? And for you girls, like what have you done well in your study, your prep, your concentration in classrooms? Like what have you done that has got you these results? And then once you've mapped out or it helps actually to write these things down or helps me to write them down. Once you've got those down on paper, you can really clearly see where your gaps are. And as soon as you identify these gaps in your routine um, from there, again, like those are just more areas or, of weaknesses that you can fill and there are more opportunities for growth. Um, so consistency and mindfulness, they really do play in together. Um, preparation. So this is obviously just when you piece together all of your hard work to get the results that you earn and you deserve. So um, my parents and actually a lot of the teachers at Surbiton used to say to me um, quite a lot that, you know, exams are not designed to like trick you out and they're not designed to sort of cheat you of the results that you've that you've sort of um, that you deserve and that you've put your work into. And it's the same for racing for us. So, you know, races should always and are sort of held to the standard they should be fair and so the athlete that has prepared the most and has prepared the best should at the end of the day always get the best result so um, we have lots of different tactics for that we've got all of our training uh, training sessions that for you girls would be like lessons and then we like to do quite a lot of like mental exercises as well to increase like our squad bonding our togetherness but something that they've been really working on us, um, working on with us recently has been visualisation, which I'm not going to lie, when the coaches first came in and started talking about us um, essentially doing uh, like mindfulness and um, meditation, we've been doing quite a lot of meditation the night before racing, it, it kind of felt a bit counterintuitive to me. Um, as uh, we were speaking about earlier, but like race nerves and everything can kind of like build up in you quite a lot and the uh, exam nerves I'm sure you'll be getting as well like can make you feel like quite tense and relaxed and for me at least like the last thing that I actually wanted to do was to sort of force myself into uh, meditation because it's not something that I've ever done before and it was out of my comfort zone um, but before a big race every night we will lie down on the floor of a hotel somewhere wherever we're racing and our coach will read out a script where they have gone through um, our whole daily schedule from when we wake up to go to breakfast, have our bags packed and then get on the bus, go to the course, do the race, come back. They go through it all and we go through all of the scenarios of what could happen in, in different race scenarios. So obviously option A is it's gone perfectly, but option B is there's been a mistake. And it really helps you prepare and internalise all of the fear before it's actually happened. and. Um, I guess the more you visualise and the more you go through how you want to feel um, on race day or in your case in a, on exam day, the less sort of uh, monumentous and the less scary the day is when it actually comes. Um, nerves, yeah, they're normal, they're natural and they're absolutely fine so we shouldn't be scared of them but personally I prefer to feel like calm and confident. Um, I know I'm never going to get over, um, get rid of all of the nerves altogether but if I can feel like calm and confident in myself, it helps me trust in the fact that I know that I have prepared well. Um, and visualisation is something that I've been doing since I was 13, inadvertently, as I say, when I was dreaming about myself racing at these big races. It helps you believe in yourself. It helps you give yourself the confidence that you belong here, that it's something that you have earned. It's something that you have practised for. Um, so visualisation has a big effect on just sort of how we attack and how we target uh 
like for me a race but for you an exam instead of being scared of it like we're prepared for it and we're ready for it so yeah I really think visualization is a, a key factor um but then yeah just finishing off um preparation can be something really simple just like organization so your notes being clear um for me like I like to we write a race plan down every every time we've got a big race and we stick to it every single time so every girl in the boat knows exactly what they're doing at every point of the race uh, it's my job to make calls on the boat so I'll be shouting at them as they go down the course but they all know what I'm going to say anyways so it could just be as something as simple as having a routine and sticking to it it could be simple of I know how I write my notes in class so that I can transfer them to revision notes really easily and it could be something like packing your bag the night before your exam and just switching off by a certain time so you're not stressing and you're not sort of like over intensifying what is already going to be a stressful situation because if you're organized and if you've prepped in advance you don't have to cram and you don't have to pressure yourself in what's already quite a stressful time um but yeah that was all i had to say so i hope that's been clear uh, but yeah I think I don't know if we're doing questions now or later, but that was it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much, Lola. We loved your talk and thank you so much for coming back. No problem. It's fun to be back. <laughs> um, just just a reminder, guys. Yes, if you do have questions for Lola or any of our speakers, do send them through on the chat function here on Teams or um, through YouTube as well, and we'll hit the guys with some of your questions at the Q and A at the end. Yes. Yeah, so finally, we have William Wadsworth, the exam study expert, who has the largest worldwide exam-based podcast, as well as recently featuring it in Times as the author of Outsmart My Exams. His talk will focus on giving practical strategies to studying and improving revision and exam technique. I don't know about you, but I always struggle with starting my revision, so his talk will be really useful in giving top tips about this. Wonderful. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, lovely to be with you and uh, seeing home the uh, seeing home this wonderful uh, array of uh, present presentations this evening. Uh, like three fabulous talks um so inspirational from from Laura, Lola and Laura Lauren and I, I just wish I had peps there to talk about the, the fundamentals of memory before I did any of my talks in schools that would make life so much easier I thought it was a wonderful and very insightful uh, uh overview of, of, of some incredibly important stuff so so thank you to, to each and every one of you and uh, big shoes to fill but let's see if I can bring home uh bring us home for this evening um so um my focus is going to be pretty practical so my 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 mission in life uh, in running exams to the expert is helping students ace their exams by studying smarter not necessarily harder so studying in the most efficient way we're going to break that down tonight in three parts for you so firstly we're going to talk about revision technique building on what Peps was talking about earlier and talking about some of the revision strategies uh, that will get you the biggest results in the most time efficient way. With that, I then want to talk a little bit about um, overcoming procrastination. Uh, I've chosen this topic because it's the one that comes up most when I ask students what's holding you back uh, from doing better in your exams. Uh, so I've picked that and I'll say a few words on some practical strategies to help with that. And then I'll finally finish with a few words on exam technique. Uh, so um, picking up nicely on what was a couple of the things that Lola in particular mentioned, uh, Lauren as well a little bit um, on, you know, things you can do in the exam hall itself to make sure you walk out with the mark you deserve and having scored as many points as possible. Folks, this is an interactive session, so if you haven't already, please do log into YouTube. Uh, I think people are mainly on YouTube um, for, for kind of viewing this. Uh, please do log in so you can use the chat if you haven't done so already. Uh, if you are already logged in, then uh, reach for the chat uh, right now because I've got a question for you. I want to hear how you revise. So if you are a student now, most of you probably listening at you know, school, Surbiton High School or elsewhere, um, how are you revising today? What's your go to technique when it comes to preparing for your exams? If you don't happen to be a student, you can still play along too. So if you're a teacher, I want to hear what you think your students do most. Uh, and if you're a parent, I want to hear what your kid 
kids do most. Um, so what is your go to revision strategy? I've got a whole bunch of ideas on the screen for you. Maybe you do something else that's not even on the screen. There is a little bit of a time lag between the, the the what I'm presenting and the YouTube comments. It's around 30 seconds or so. I've been keeping an eye, so I won't be able to pick up on your comments in real time. I will let them come in. Please do uh, let them come in uh, and I'll take a look back at them in 30 seconds or so. So very exciting to be talking to you here from the future. Uh, 30 seconds time. Uh, please do pop in the comments or at the live chat in YouTube. How do you revise? Um, great. So while you're doing that, there's, there's all these different revision techniques and I had a whole set of examples on the screen uh, a moment ago. When we're talking about effective or ineffective strategies, we use a very deliberate set of language. So I talk about long way techniques uh, versus smart way techniques. And that's really just to emphasize that when we're using less effective techniques, the long way techniques, it's not that they don't work at all, you will learn something by using long way techniques. It's just that they take a longer time to get you the same results and you're more likely to be disappointed with what you can remember when the test or exam rolls around. By contrast, we don't want that, of course. We want to be using smart way techniques. We want to be making the biggest progress in the shortest amount of time. And all these different ways we could be revising. Um, I had a bunch of examples on screen. People in the comments have mentioned flashcards, practice papers, mind maps, um, all sorts of different ways people revise. Um, what all smart way techniques have in common is one underlying principle, and that's the principle of retrieval practice. That is psychologists speak for simply testing yourself. So not kind of pushing knowledge into memory, not taking in information through your senses by reading it or hearing it, rather by pulling knowledge out of memory, testing yourself in some way. Um, pulling pulling memory pulling pulling knowledge out of the the big library of your mind or the big forest of your mind as as Pepsi's analogy from earlier <coughs> you don't have to take my word for it um i think it's such an important point i want to give you a little bit of the evidence um we have now literally hundreds if not possibly thousands of experimental studies published experimental studies done on the power of retrieval practice uh the one i've chosen to show you tonight is it's probably one of the most famous ones it's the one everybody cites in the academic literature when they're writing about retrieval practice um it was done by researchers henry rodinger and jeffrey Karpicki uh back in 2006 and they came up with a really simple experiment they took two groups of students asked them both to learn um, a, a set of materials. Uh, one was about sea otters of all things uh, and asked them both to, to, to kind of learn this information and said there'd be a test uh, that they'd come back for. Um, there was an interesting twist to this experiment though. So on their way out of the learning session, so this was a week before the test, um, a week or so before the test, they, they asked the students, OK, thanks very much for your time today in the learning session. We're going to bring you back uh, in a week or so for the test. Just before you leave the room today, could you please leave a prediction for what you think you will score on that test? And when you look at the students' predictions, this tends to surprise people. Uh, this, this tends to sort of surprise people. Like the re, the reread, the, the group that have been doing the rereading, um, not the retrieval practice strategy, were actually more confident than the retrieval practice group. So um, this kind of disconnect between what you know. We, we, we know is going to work best, the retrieval practice, and what the students were, th were thinking was going to work best. Um, and one bit, of, one bit of background I should give to this study, it wasn't just kind of people off the street that were participating. These were, these were college level students, so they've been taking exams for, you know, for years, and you know, you thought they'd have figured this stuff out by now. So these were the actual test results. Um, you can see the rereaders you know, scoring far, far lower than they had predicted for themselves. Uh, and the retrieval practice group not only slightly outperforming their own prediction, but handily outperforming the rereading group um, by, a, by a kind of a 20 percentage point margin. Uh, to kind of translate that into sort of exam grade terms, at GCSE, that could be the difference between a three and a six. Uh, at A level, that could be the difference between an E and a C. So two whole grades at A level, uh, two, maybe even three at GCSE. So an enormous margin of difference not by working harder, not by putting in more hours, but by simply switching your choice of technique. That's what we're fighting for. That's the power uh, that this stuff can make. Um, and, you know, great that some of you in the in the chat tonight are mentioning sort of retrieval practice techniques already. So flashcards, popular practice questions, self marking popular, all really nice ways to do retrieval practice. 
just to make sure we're on the same page in terms of the different options for doing retrieval practice in practice. Let me just run through some of the main ones. And this isn't an exhaustive list, uh, but this captures kind of most of the major uh, and, and the most popular options. I've slightly categorized these into um, techniques that involve queued recall. So testing yourself uh, where you're trying to remember a relatively limited amount of information in response to a queue or question. So kind of short answers um, versus free recall uh, where you are remembering sort of larger, more comprehensive amounts of information about a particular topic uh, in response to uh, a, a kind of a, a nudge uh, on, on, the, on the general topic area. So specific examples of revision strategies that fall into these two buckets. Uh, well, flashcards would be the classic example of queued recall. So you've got a clear question on the front, clear answer on the back. That's that's that would be classic queued recall. Um, and of course, these days we have many digital options as well as the old school paper options, uh, tools like Quizlet. I think someone mentioned that in the in the chat tonight. Um, Anki, um, many many others, Brainscape, Remnote, all sorts. Q&A notes as well. I'll come back to Q&A notes in a couple of slides. On the free recall end of things, we have techniques like blurting uh, or brain dumps, uh, which is essentially uh, where you take a blank piece of paper or even a whiteboard and just try and remember everything you can about that topic. Explaining to someone else, uh, it would be another way to do this. Um, so the kind of verbal equivalent of that. Test questions and past papers can span the full spectrum. So some past paper questions, you know, multiple choice questions or short answer questions where you just ask for a definition, for example, that would be very much in the queued recall end of things. Uh, whereas longer mark, longer answer questions in the exam, so, you know, 12, 20, 30 mark questions um, where you have to, you know, write what's effectively a, a kind of essay or mini essay, uh, that would be much more uh, in, in the kind of free, free recall end of things. So all of these strategies kind of serve slightly different functions in your overall uh, revision process. So queued recall tends to be a really efficient way for just learning the kind of fundamental knowledge. Uh, so for particularly for knowledge rich uh, subjects like sciences or uh, you know learning your vocabulary for languages, flashcards are a phenomenally efficient way to do it. Recall tends to be particularly helpful when you need to practice synthesizing knowledge, so drawing ideas together uh, across multiple areas. So particularly when you have those kind of, a, sort of almost like essay style questions in the exam, free recall is a really good way to practice for that. Practice questions and uh, past papers serve a couple of functions. So they help you to, well, perhaps having learned the knowledge with flashcards, they would help you to practice applying the knowledge in exam style situations. Uh, make sure that you, um, you know, are producing answers in the kind of format and style that the examiner wants to see. Uh, as well as practicing skills, whether that's the skill of problem solving in maths or the skill of writing in English, for example. Now, we set out to answer the question a few years back, are students actually using smart way strategies? What's the kind of state of the nation uh, when we look at the UK's revision habits? Uh, so we partnered with Henry Rodinger from the classic 2006 study a couple of slides back, uh, the, the world famous Washington University uh, memory lab, uh, and we designed a questionnaire together to uh, and we sent it out to uh, we, we've now had over 50 we've had now had about 50,000 students fill in this questionnaire uh, over a number of years uh, and, and this is the, this is some of the headline findings so when we look across the UK we still see around 45 percent of students so nearly half of students uh, favoring uh, what we'd consider a relatively ineffective strategy so a long way strategy uh, such as rereading or making notes uh, as being their kind of go to or main revision strategy um, so, you know, this isn't as bad a picture as it was, uh, we would suspect, going back sort of 10 years. Um, improvement has been made, you know, practice flashcards are on the rise, practice questions quite popular. Um, and certainly when you look at some specific schools, you know, the, the, there's very, very, uh, you know, effective strategies at, at, at work. Some schools, are, you know, a particular school, you know, might perform really, really well. Uh, this is the kind of national average, um, which is a picture of, you know, some progress has been made, but there's still some room for improvement. One of our top tips for how to make the switch, because it's not 
it's not it's some it's sort of sometimes easier said than done you know if you, you're particularly used to re revising in a particular way it's not always straightforward to switch uh, to a different strategy so one of the things we suggest is trying to find ways to upgrade what you're doing today uh, so you don't have to feel like you're changing to a totally different strategy you're just taking what you're doing today and making a few changes to it to make it a lot better so one of the good examples of this is when it comes to making notes. So making notes, you may remember from the previous slide, is currently the country's uh, kind of third most popular revision strategy um, after rereading and flashcards. Um, really, really popular strategy. Lots of people use it. I think Lola mentioned it a couple of times. And um, what we'd suggest when it comes to making notes is rather than making kind of long form notes, the full width of the page, like we've got here on the left hand side of the screen, switch to what we would call Q&A notes, where you start to divide your page down the middle. Uh, and for every key point you want to capture in your notes, you split it into a question and an answer pair. So you put your question or your cue in the left hand column, your answer in the right hand column. And these, these don't need to be full sentence questions or anything like that. It could just be a, a single word or a couple of words uh, to cue up the, 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 the nugget of information you're trying to test yourself on. And of course, the benefit of doing it this way is that rather than simply rereading your notes later, doing setting your notes out like this encourages you to retest yourself on your notes. So you do retrieval practice. Your notes are ready made for retrieval. Peps was describing how you want to take the sort of simplest path from A to B. Um, so this effectively cuts out a whole step, you know, rather than making notes and then like transferring them into flashcards or something um, so you can test yourself. This lets you make notes which you can then test yourself on. Uh, so a nice, uh, a really nice upgrade if you're used to making notes. One other idea is if you're used to making mind maps. So uh, unless you're fortunate like Lauren to have a perfect photographic memory where you can kind of remember any visual information you see, uh, for most people it doesn't quite work like that. And um, what we want to focus on instead is rather than kind of spending, investing a huge amount of time in the kind of quality of the artistry uh, of your mind map, um, instead uh, focus on, you know, doing your mind map from memory, particularly, you know, maybe you don't do that for the first time, maybe you do, um, but certainly uh, for kind of subsequent times you, you kind of draw your mind maps, you know, trying to recreate the key points from memory and thereby doing the retrieval practice, pulling knowledge out of memory. Um, some people do this on a whiteboard, which I think is a really nice idea because it encourages you not to spend too long on the presentation because you know you'll just be scrubbing it clean uh, at the end of the process. So it kind of encourages you to to um, to focus on on kind of drawing it out nice and efficiently, capturing the information nice and efficiently, not spending as long on the presentation uh, and focusing on the retrieval practice, which is the important bit. So just to just to kind of um, finish finish uh, my my thoughts on uh, sort of specific revision techniques and what to choose and um, even once you've chosen a uh, chosen an effective strategy we still need to apply it skillfully um, so here are some common pitfalls to avoid the first one i've just been mentioning so the artist um, this would be uh, someone who's revising that spends a lot of time making their revision materials and so runs out of time to do the testing phase uh, so we mentioned, uh, I've talked about how that applies to mind maps. I'll just briefly mention how it would apply to flashcards. So this flashcard I've got here on the screen, it's very neat, um, you know, lots of colours underlining. And um, I would much rather that flashcard had been made perhaps a little less a little less focus on the presentation, perhaps make it twice as quickly. Uh, so you save yourself more time later for testing yourself on your flashcards. I think it's about 55% of students that use flashcards say they spend the majority of their flashcard time on the making phase. We want to split flip that on its head. We want us, you to spend the majority of your time on the testing phase. So focus on testing your flashcards because that's the retrieval practice. That's the bit that gets the knowledge to stick. <coughs> The early flipper would be this would be someone who um, looks at the answer too soon. So flips over the flashcard too soon before you've had a proper search of your memory or with practice questions, reaching for the mark scheme too early or your notes and kind of looking those little bits up. Sit on that temptation. See what you can do from memory. Have a little guess if you need to. It's all great practice for the exam and it's all fabulous retrieval practice. It doesn't matter if you get some wrong answers in your retrieval practice. It matters that you try. So long as you see what the right answer should have been at the end of the process. So if you are 
scribbling out what you can remember about a topic on a whiteboard, make sure you check back on your notes after you've done that to see you've remembered it all accurately. And if you haven't, add in any key points or corrections, possibly in a different color to make sure you've uh, remembered everything accurately. Similarly, if you're explaining to someone else, if they're not an expert on the material themselves, then make sure that after the explanation, you look back at your notes on that material uh, and just kind of make a, make a note, perhaps possibly even a literal note, were there any key points you missed? Was there anything you misremembered and you said wrong? Make a little note of those points. Uh, as, uh, uh, you know, check your working effectively, even when you're in that context of explaining to someone else. <coughs> and finally, you know, we, we see this a lot, you know, a kind of a, a, a um, students kind of putting off the retrieval practice phase of the process until, uh, you know, they feel really comfortable with the material. So, for example, making a lot of notes or doing a lot of rereading or doing a lot of open book practice questions uh, to, to start with and, and kind of spending too long in that phase and not being bold enough to move on sooner into the retrieval practice because they're worried they might get some answers wrong perhaps. Again, doesn't matter if you get answers wrong in your retrieval practice. It is great learning whether you get an answer right or an answer wrong. So long as, as I say, when if you do get an answer wrong, you always make sure uh, you've given yourself the opportunity to see the right answer. You see that feedback uh, and that helps the right information to stick. So retrieval practice is awesome and is going to solve all our learning problems. Well, almost. Um, there's one other idea we need to combine it with to really uh, master our memorization. So I've got a question for you guys. If you're trying to memorize a topic for best results, which of these should you do? Either revisit the topic on different days, revise as hard as possible on a single day, or either of the above, it doesn't really matter. And I'd love you to register your answer via the chat. So just type in a one, a two or a three, uh, depending on which one of these you think is the best answer. Um, if you're not sure, feel free to have a guess. Give me your best instinct. Um, but yeah, number one for if you think it's best to revisit the topic across different days. Number two, you think it's best to just master it on one day or number three, uh, it doesn't really matter how you uh, structure your work as long as you, you know, Make sure you put in the time at some point. So one, two or three via the chat uh, if you'd be so kind. Thank you. The instant you stop learning, you start to forget. So uh, uh, Peps showed us uh, the, the forgetting curve towards the end of his presentation. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up neatly where, where he left off, which is that um, as time passes, so time here on the X axis, the amount you can successfully remember goes down and down and down. So this is a classic psychology, German psychologist Hermann Ebbinghaus back in, I think it was 1885, 1886. Um, really, really ancient bit of psychology, but it stood the test of time and it stands up to modern uh, replications as well. The best way to combat that uh, is to retest ourselves at time intervals. So note, I don't just say look at the material again or revisit the material. I'm very specifically saying retest yourself at time intervals. Now, everybody unanimously has said that's what we want to do. You all told me via the chat that we want to be revisiting the topic on different days. So like, if you all know this is what we should be doing anyway, why are we even having this conversation? Why am I even bothering to talk about it? Well, the reason I'm talking about it is because this is typically what we see. Like lots of students have a really good instinct that we should be doing spacing. That's not the problem. The problem is actually implementing that principle. So it's an easy principle to understand. It's an easy principle to get your head around, but actually acting on it is challenging, is hard. So one of our top tips uh, is how to actually put spaced learning into action so we can act on it consistently. And we do it as follows. So or we suggest doing it as follows. So get in the habit every time you sit down for a session of revision, whether you're doing 20 minutes, half an hour, 40 minutes, whatever you do, take five minutes before you look at any new material to test yourself on whatever it was you did in the last study session. So every time you sit down to revise, take five minutes, test yourself on whatever it was you did last time. So if you are making flashcards in the last block of revision, great, test yourself on the flashcards. If you were um, doing practice questions in the last revision session, well, okay, 
maybe you wouldn't redo all the practice questions that might not be a good use of time but maybe you take one or two questions that you struggled with or that you got wrong uh, and have a second attempt at those and make sure you can remember what you learned about how to solve those uh, and, and answer those questions if that's all you do that will already catapult you into the sort of top fraction of a percent of students uh, across the country in terms of your consistency of spacing um but if you really want to go uh, take this idea to the max um or, or, or if you really want to take this idea further, not really to the max, that's over, over, over egging it. But if you want to take this idea a step further, um, we'd suggest adding in a weekly recap. So at the end of the week, test yourself uh, and everything you've done that week. So maybe take a whole day uh, worth of revision. So any revision you do, say on a Friday, it's not new material. You're just retesting yourself for now a second round for a second time on whatever you've covered that week. It's not necessarily about spending more hours on each topic so much as spreading that time out over more days. And it's really this combination of retrieval practice plus spacing that's the most efficient way, the most powerful way to consolidate information and get it to stick for the long term and to prevent forgetting uh, known to cognitive psychologists. <coughs> I wanted to say a few words on overcoming procrastination. So there's lots of things I could have talked about in this slot, but I chose procrastination, as I said at the start, because it's the one that uh, you know comes up the most when students are talking about what holds them back in their revision. So when you think about the sorts of things you procrastinate on, the sorts of tasks that you procrastinate on, it's not a coincidence that you procrastinate on those things. Psychologist Dr. Tim Peichel uh, has done a lot of research on this, uh, amongst others, uh, and his research indicates that we procrastinate uh, for several reasons that really boil down to two main themes. We procrastinate when we feel daunted by a large or difficult task, or we procrastinate when our motivation for that task is low. What can we do to overcome it? Well, when we feel daunted by a large task, so um, major written project or perhaps revising for an exam, you'd start by breaking it down and not necessarily breaking down the whole project, uh, but perhaps just thinking about the next step. What is the next step I could do in the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes of time that could move me forward, uh, even if it's starting in the middle? You know, just start, just do something, even if it's starting in the middle, even if it's starting at the end, even if it's not your best work at first, you know, particularly in the context of a writing task. Sometimes we need to get that sort of iffy first draft out of the way first before we can polish it up, tidy it up uh, and make it uh, something that we're proud of. When our motivation for the task is low, we might want to do a why brainstorm. So this is simply sitting down and brainstorming all the reasons why this task matters to us, why your exams matter to you, why you want to do well. Uh, I sometimes do this in, in our kind of live workshops in schools and you know, I, I, we have some fabulous answers to this. You know, I, I, I was doing this in a school in London a couple of weeks ago, um, rough area in London, uh, this was too. And some of the answers that came out were just so moving. You know, one, one guy said um, he wants to do well in his, his exams uh, so that he can be a role model for his younger brothers and sisters. That was, that was beautiful. Um, someone else said they want to do well in their exams. So that leads to good career prospects. So that means that in times to come, they will be able to better look after their family. I thought it was so powerful thinking about, you know, your role in this case, this is, this is, a, this is a young young man thinking about his role as a father and what he wants to be able to, to do in kind of providing for his family. I thought was, that, was, that was wonderful, so inspiring. Um, so digging deep, thinking of all the reasons why exam success matters in the moment, in the future, uh, digging deep uh, and, 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 and kind of reigniting your fire to do well. I also love clear routines. This has come a couple of times. Uh, Pep's mentioned this. Uh, I think uh, either Lauren or Lola might have mentioned it as well. Uh, I love clear routine as well. Um, it touches on so many different bits of, of behavioural science. It's the science of setting a clear intention for yourself. Such a powerful bit of behaviour change psychology. The power of building a habit, something that you get used to. Um, this is obviously just an example uh, of a kind of, a, you know, the sort of thing you might come up with if you're looking at your your kind of day to day routine right throughout the school year. Um, here's another example of, you know, maybe when you're on study leave, you come up with a little timetable for the day. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what your routine looks like. It will be personal to you. Um, uh, but just having that routine is such a powerful. You might not stick to it, you know, 100 percent of the time, um, but you'll stick to it a heck of a lot closer than if you didn't sit down and write out your intentions to start with. 
There's a little pro tip, just kind of tying some of our themes together. You might add in some spaced retrieval practice as a dedicated block in as part of your routine. Uh, so for example, we talked about, you know, Fridays as an example. Uh, you could choose any day, it doesn't have to be Friday, um, but saying that, you know, whatever revision you're doing on a Friday, no new material, that's just retesting everything you've done uh, for the week up to uh, that day. Finally, I want to say a few really brief words on exam technique. Um, so four quick fire tips to help you score higher. In at number four, for multiple choice questions, give each answer option a rating. This sounds like such a simple and such a kind of basic tip, but it's so powerful um, in, in kind of helping you make sure you're evaluating the options consistently, uh, honing in on the right, honing in on the best options and ultimately giving you the best possible chance of selecting the right one. Number three, and again, you may be starting to do this, but I'd encourage you to go much further. Don't just read the question, write all over the question. So underline the keywords, put a box around the command words or the key data, maybe even annotate it, add your own thoughts as you're starting to read it through. Not only does it help you engage with the question and start to um, you know, really kind of get to grips with what it's asking, it also de-risks you from getting, like missing something important in the question, like the, like the word not, which could flip the whole meaning of the question on its head. Uh, so it helps avoid the risk that you, you miss something uh, and, and, and thereby get far lower marks than you would deserve. In at number two, be greedy for marks. So this was in the words of my chemistry teacher, be greedy for marks. And I kind of carried that, that little mantra in my head through many, many of my exams. It's a little bit like the equivalent of Lauren's uh, heart of a lion concept, you know, in the moment when you're, um, you know, maybe not quite sure or, or kind of at a slight wobble moment, uh, you know, being greedy for marks or having the heart of a lion, you know, whatever works for you, uh, you know, making sure you rise to the occasion and score all the points you can every single time. So this applies both when you're not stuck and when you're stuck. So if you're not stuck first, always make sure, you know, ask yourself the question, can you add anything else? Can you go further? Can you be more complete in your answer uh, before you leave it? And if you are stuck, well, firstly, be greedy for marks, have the heart of a lion um, and, and, and don't panic. See what you can make of that question. So perhaps starting just by summarising the key information in the question itself, just writing down what the question tells you or what it asks. Um, patiently search your memory. Sometimes memory just takes a little bit of time to kick in. It's not there instantly, but you can find it. Sometimes you can help to jog that process by brainstorming you know, related ideas. So brainstorm related points uh, and that can sometimes help to trigger your memory for the actual thing you're trying to remember. If it's in, if it's, uh, you know, you're doing some analysis, then is there anything you can infer or calculate? Even if it's not all the way through to the answer, you may at least get some method marks for it and it may even trigger your ideas for how you could get all the way through to the final answer. And if all else fails, never leave a blank. Um, none of your exams, I'm, I'm reasonably confident in saying, are negatively marked. You'll never lose marks for writing something wrong, but make it an educated guess, make it a sensible guess. If you do that 10 times across a season of exams, you might just get lucky once or twice and get a good answer and get a mark, an extra mark or two. And it, that could be all it takes, uh, the equivalent of a you know, single second in a race that gets you the gold medal. It could be that one or two marks that you get for a lucky guess uh, that put you over the boundary and get you a grade that you wouldn't have otherwise scored. And then finally, in at number one, extra time planning your answer speeds you up, not slows you down and leads to better quality answers. I won't go into this in too much detail, but it's partly to do with what Pets was talking about uh, with the idea of working memory, that limited capacity uh, sort of thinking space. You know, if we overload working memory in the moment while we're trying to write an answer by having it think about like all the things you want to say throughout the whole essay, it's really difficult to kind of work through writing up that sentence uh, and you're more likely to kind of forget things that you should say. Much better to spend a few moments, be generous with your time in planning out what you want to say and then it's really easy to write it all up and turn it into sentences and paragraphs. And as a top tip, if you have a combination of long answers and short answers, uh, turn straight to the long answer questions. They're often at the back uh, and plan those before you do anything else while you're at the start of the exam, while you're fresh uh, and, and while you're, you've still got time on your side. And then if things go wrong later in the exam, you're running behind on time, you're getting a bit anxious, you can fall back on having a really solid plan uh, and it's much easier to write up a good quality answer. 
For further listening, do seek out the Exams to the Expert podcast. It's freely available anywhere good podcasts are found. Um, you know, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your podcast listen, uh, podcast app of choice. Um, and folks, I've got a goodie bag for you here tonight. Uh, head, snap the QR code or head to examstudyexperts.com forward slash slam, uh, where you'll be able to find a couple of useful things. I've got an exam success cheat sheet for you. So I've summarized uh, some of my favorite uh, ideas for helping you study smarter uh, on a single sheet. Uh, so six pillars of studying smart, all nicely summarized on a single sheet uh, for ease of reference. Um, I've included uh, my kind of pick of the podcast, so five episodes I recommend starting with, particularly this time of year with exams looming, uh, that will help you get the biggest mark possible. So if you want to kind of go deeper into any of the things we talked about tonight, uh, that's a great place to start. And then I've also included a little pack of, of kind of inspirational uh, study exam progress related uh, quotes, posters uh, for your desktop background or possibly even print out and put on the wall if you want to help keep you motivated. All that remains is for me to sincerely wish you every success in your exams this summer and beyond. It's been a huge pleasure meeting you all tonight. Thank you so much and good luck. Thank you so much, William. That was really useful. That's great. Thanks so, so much. And thanks for that goodie bag. That's really good of you. Um, I've just snapped a QR code on myself for that, for that and check that one out. Uh, OK, so um, let's head to our Q&A then, guys. I know you've been sending in questions both on the Teams chat forum and on YouTube, so we'll see if we can throw a few of those at our speakers now. <laughs> Yes, we've got a question for William on whether you think it's best doing a long session of revision on one subject or dividing the session up across different subjects. I would say it depends how I, the first thing I'd say is how long is long, like don't sit at your desk for three hours. That's not going to be good for anybody's focus or concentration. Um, so I'd always say have, you know, take take breaks, you know, even if it's just a few minutes at the top of the hour to go get some water or kind of stretch your legs a little bit. Um, make sure you you, you stay fresh. Um, in terms of how you divide your time, I think there's pros and cons to both approaches. So kind of chopping it up or um, doing longer blocks of one subject. You know, the long blocks of one subject can help, can kind of give you um, a sense of making more progress, can kind of help you get your teeth into that subject a little bit more. So, you know, if it's particularly complex or you're really trying to, you know, get to get your teeth into it, sometimes just doing a kind of a, a longer block on one thing and, and really trying to get to grips with it can be helpful. Though bear in mind what we were talking about before in terms of the spacing point, you know, we do still want to be able to revisit and retest ourselves on that learning uh, later in the day or at the end of the week, maybe even a little bit later than that still um, for, for that kind of spacing effect. Um, chopping and changing between subjects can make it a bit easier to do the kind of spacing uh, thing um, and can also, um, what's the other thing I was going to say? Yeah, can sometimes, you know, sometimes people find, you know, that helps them stay a little bit fresher because they're constantly kind of looking at something new. Um, so, you know, pros and cons to both. Uh, either, 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 can, either can work well so long as you're not doing massive long stints without taking breaks and so long as you're still doing the, the kind of spacing principle. Great, thank you. Right, thanks. Uh, I want a question come in for Peps. This one is from Alicia, and she asks, "What's what's the difference between instructional, instructional and behavioural routines? And does this to apply does this apply to revision or classroom based learning?" Yeah, sure. So um, earlier on, when I talked about routines, and you know, well picked up on their power as well. And um, what I didn't mention is that a helpful way of categorizing them is by thinking about both instructional routines or learning routines and uh, kind of like logistical routines might be another way to think about it. And so logistical routines might be uh, those routines that you get into to make sure you're in the right place at the right time. So, you know, but like Will was suggesting, like have a look at your weekly calendar and identify a time when you are going to, you know, put in some revision uh, identify a place you're going to do it and make sure your like environment is set up so that you don't have to go around and find your pencil or calculator or whatever it is. So those are the kinds of like logistical routines that are really powerful. When you have those in place, it creates the time and the space for effective learning and revision. However, you can also have more instructional, more learning type routines as well. 
And that's the kind of routine that happens whenever you're in that space, whenever you're actually doing some learning. Um, and a bit like kind of also Will pointed out earlier, there are some kind of ways that you can set up your your learning routine. You know, what do I do first? Oh, well, maybe I'll start by revisiting or the very first thing I'll do is some retrieval practice before moving into, you know, whatever of the other uh, like effective uh, revision strategies you have in place. And if you set up your kind of sequence of, of activities in a way that you can repeat over and over again, then you, Whenever you sit down to revise, you don't have to spend like five minutes thinking, oh, what am I going to do? How am I going to spend my time? You can get straight into it every time. And so those two types of routines, when combined, really give you lots of power in terms of making the most of the time you have available. Logistical routines and learning routines. Great, that's really helpful. Thanks, Peps. We've also had another question come in about a productive environment and, and another one that kind of links to that, what you're saying about logistic, uh, logistical routines. Is there any evidence to suggest that sort of the brain works better, like say when you're in a set environment, your room, your space, this is where you're used to learning and therefore your, your brain is then used to that? Or is it advantageous, for example, to change out and say, right, I'm going down to Pret, and that new environment is actually going to stimulate me more. Well, I'm not aware of any specific res research that tests like, you know, your study versus PRET. Or <laughs> However, what we do know is that when we find ourselves in new environments or in places where there uh, are things that are different, our brain tends to like lock into those things that are different. And so whenever earlier on when I was talking about like removing the different like the number of different distractions available and um, you can do that by just putting yourself in a very familiar place because when you sit in your study or in your room time and time again eventually all of those things around you kind of get filtered out they're no longer new or interesting for your brain and that allows you to focus more on the kind of thing that you want to learn if you're down in like prep for Costa or the library every time, then your brain just going to be like constantly uh, being distracted by the stuff that you you haven't come across before. So I think yeah, part of a good routine is about being in the same place every time. Ideally, uh, ideally a place that doesn't have a lot of distractions in the, in the environment. Can I can I jump in too? <laughs> um, I think yeah, I absolutely absolutely agree with 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 everything. And um, one 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 little little kind of Bonus tip from from me is just about helping you kind of prepare for exam pressure. Um, so we've been lucky to have been joined by some uh, eminent athletes here this evening. Um, and and one thing you know a lot of athletes will do in preparing them for race day is find ways to kind of recreate some of the conditions of the big game or the big race or whatever it is in training, so that when they do the race or the big game, they're less phased by what's going on around them. So, for example, you know, you walk around a big um, American college campus on a Friday afternoon, college campus on a Friday afternoon, you know, you'll hear match day music blaring out over the speakers in the big sports stadium uh, during the athletes in their Friday afternoon training. That's to help start them to get them used to what it's going to be like in the big game the following day on Saturday. Um, so I think there's merit in students taking a kind of similar approach. So part of that is making the most of mock, mock exam opportunities that school gives you um, but part of it is also finding perhaps ways particularly if you struggle with pressure and exam nerves perhaps finding opportunities to practice you know working perhaps taking your own mock exams under timed conditions in situations that aren't quite as comfortable as your bedroom maybe going and finding a maybe there is a study room at school or you know maybe there's a local library that has a sort of silent reading room you know somewhere where you're a little bit out of your comfort zone ideally where there's other people around you kind of working away in silence uh, so you get used to uh, you know taking the exam in those conditions too great that's really helpful thanks William um, do you have another question coming, Lou? Yeah, we had another question for you, William. Um, do you recommend different strategies or methods for different subjects? Yeah, so it slightly goes back to what I was saying about like the different revision strategies have slightly different strengths and weaknesses. So for a very, you know, content rich subject, where there's just a lot of factual knowledge to learn, like sciences, you know, I'd probably be doing a lot of like flashcard or um, um, 
you know, Q&A notes work to kind of learn all the details, but always have a good healthy dose of practice questions too. make sure your exam technique is on point uh, and you know what you're going to face on exam day and you're ready for it. For something like maths or English, where there's less to like actually know, um, your focus will be more on the practice questions uh, and, and practicing that. Um, but there still might be a little bit of a role for, you know, isolating some of the tricky little knowledge points uh, and, and hitting those with flashcards. So for example, in maths, you might do a set of flashcards on the formulas you need to know. For English, you might do a set of flashcards on the quotes that you need to know for Macbeth or whatever you're studying. Um, so you've got, so you're always kind of using different techniques in combination uh, to, to kind of get you the best results on whatever subject you're doing, depending on what's required from that subject. Great, I think uh, we might have one more. Yeah, we have another open question to either of you on whether if you're doing a GCC student doing, say, 10 subjects, whether you should try and balance them all across the whole GCC sort of revision period or facing different subjects in different weeks and like taking your time in different places. Is, is that clear, guys, the question now, whether, you, whether we would run them all concurrently, I guess, is there any advantage for that or is it better to, to chunk them down into different weeks? Either one of you, perhaps, or William, would you like to pick that up? I'm going to defer to Will. It's a great question. Though. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing what he says. <laughs> I'll, I'll have a go. You can you can jump in if there's anything else you think is useful to say. Um, I would say the danger with the kind of different weeks uh, for different subjects is you might end up, you know, if you've got 10 subjects and 10 weeks to go before an exam, that means you're doing one subject 10 weeks before the exam, which is quite a long time uh, and you're more likely to, you know, start to forget some of what you, you've done, even if you revise well, you know, that forgetting curve. Um, and then, you know, the subject you do the week before the exam, you, it's sort of all quite fresh <laughs> uh, in, in, in memory. So I probably would, and, and there's also a risk that, you know, you run short on time and kind of run out of time for a subject. So, you know, I probably would be doing, you know, recommend a sort of slightly more balanced approach. Um, you know, I think it sort of slightly ties in with some of the Pepsi thoughts on, on routine, but you know, one principle that sometimes works for, for kind of GCSE is the idea of theme days. So you kind of set up your routine and you've got your kind of, you know, I, get, I work at these times in the evening um, and each day of the week has its own job. So, um, you know, Mondays is for chemistry and physics. Tuesdays is for, um, you know, first half is for art, second half is for maths. Uh, Wednesdays, well, English is really tricky for me, so I'm going to do Wednesday dedicated to English. So each day of the week has its own job. And so, um, you know, you, you're kind of getting a balance through the week on, on the different subjects um, without being kind of too granular in the details of your plan. Because if you come up with a plan that's like crazy, crazy detailed, it's quite difficult to stick to. I think the theme day approach kind of gets a nice balance between you know, having enough detail that you kind of know what you're doing and you get a decent spread across the different subjects, um, but not so detailed that it's hard to stick to in, in practice and not flexible enough that you can't kind of shift it around a little bit. So if you get on top of English and you decide you, you know, don't need a full day on it anymore, you know, it's quite easy to change, tweak that plan um, and dial back to like half a day on English and on Wednesdays um, and dial up how much time you're spending on maths or something else. I think that would be what I would say. I don't know if anyone's got anything else to add. <laughs> oh, I think that's a great advice. Oh, the only thing that might be worth adding to that is that um, like revision planning is a complex exercise. Um, and people who plan complex things like this do what is called backwards planning, where they start with the end point and they plan backwards. And so what that means is like, you know that if you've got an exam on this particular day, you know that you want to like save the morning and put, or potentially the day before to do your kind of last big revision session on that. And then you also know that to get to that point, you'll have to have done before then all of the kind of like activities and notes and condensation and uh, you know, uh, queued card retrieval. Um, and so you need to book in all of those things. And so it's always best to kind of start with this point and, sort of the end in mind and then work your way backwards from that to kind of map out your schedule um, and that's the greatest like chance of you ending up in a good place basically. 
That's great. Uh, thanks very much, guys. That's super helpful. And I think we'll wrap up the questions there. Um, and that just leaves us to say thanks. Yes, thank you, Pat and Lola. And to Lauren and William. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of us. Thank you to you guys for joining us. Thank you to our wonderful speakers. Um, we hope it's been really useful and that you're able, you've all learned something tonight and really got some practical takeaway strategies that's really going to help you rethink your way to success this summer. Yes, <laughs> thank you guys. So thanks everyone, we'll see you later.